This is the face of an American crime wave. Too young to vote, too young to drink, but old enough to wreak havoc on society. And it's scary. These kids are very scary. Kids paying the adult price. Now we're faced with the most frightening danger of all. Kids behind bars for so long, they may come out worse than when they went in. Deadly silence fell over the Edgewood Mobile Home Park as residents here learned 69-year-old Doris Swindle had been strangled to death in her home. Even more shocking, police arrested a 14-year-old neighbor who confessed to the crime. In Colorado, 12-year-olds can now be tried as adults. Weinstein's alleged murderer, 17-year-old Michael Lossain, who investigators claim carjacked the 45-year-old teacher. And tonight, her family is stunned and devastated, wondering why anyone would want to kill her. In Virginia, 14-year-olds charged with the most violent crimes are automatically tried as adults. A 13-year-old girl charged with gunning down 23-year-old Marie Rivera. And now... Jessica Gonzalez may be the youngest person ever tried for murder as an adult. From babies to baby-faced killers, the U.S. has seen a 10-year rise in juvenile crime. The teen murder rate has tripled. Even though the most recent statistics show crime rates in large cities declining, the number of youths arrested from 1991 to 1994 doubled to 2.7 million. Youth violence has been called a national crisis. In response, states throughout the Union have changed laws during the last four years to make it easier to send kids to prison, to do adult time for adult crimes. I'm serving 38 to life, and uh, my first parole board hearing is in 2032. Bobby Sheets is an example of this new attitude towards young offenders. Convicted at age 15, he got no special consideration because of his age. He now lives at Ohio's Madison Correctional, a maximum security adult prison. Today, he's one of nearly 100 kids under 18 in that state's prison system. In September 1994, he and some friends lured Abby Worrell and Jamie Kelly out for a night of partying in a quiet town outside of Columbus. I was not the actual shooter, but you know, I didn't really try to stop it. I mean, he has no remorse to this day, at least as far as I'm aware. It was one of the most gruesome crimes Fairfield County Prosecutor David Landefeld had seen in his 14 years on the job. And it was a planned uh, killing. Both girls were shot in the head, and their bodies were stashed in a barn. All conspired to lure Abby down from her home in Pascala uh, one Friday or Saturday evening uh, for the sole purpose of killing her. And unfortunately for, for Jamie Kelly, she had uh, agreed to spend the night with Abby that night. You know, when we was back out in the field, a lot of stuff went wrong. And uh, Abby Worrell and uh, Jamie Kelly, they got shot. And every, uh, the rest of us, we just started freaking out. Abby didn't die immediately, so her killers dropped a concrete block on her head. Bobby's mother, Elsie, drove the kids back to the barn to burn it down and destroy the evidence a week later. There was significant planning that went into this, along with uh, Bobby's mother, who at the time I believe was 56 years old. Why this happened may never be known. There's really nothing that would at least satisfy me as to a motive that would even explain why uh, a juvenile would, would do this to a, another juvenile. But Bobby Sheets hardly holds himself responsible. In his mind, it was just a bad turn of luck. You know what happened to the, you know what happened to the girls? You know, that shouldn't have happened. You know, I realized that. You know, but I was on drugs. You know, all that was happening right then. In fact, the convicted murderer feels he should get out someday. I'd, yeah, I'd like to get a second chance. I was 15 years old. I ain't, I ain't thinking straight. You know, I'm on the drugs, I'm on all that. Unfortunately, Bobby is not going to have an opportunity to, to relearn. There are two dead girls. Karen Worrell is the victim's mother. I don't have a chance to help mold the rest of the years that she might have had. And I think these laws, they, it's easy to go too far. 
but they do represent a step, at least, in the right direction. John DiGiulio, Jr., renowned criminologist and Princeton professor, believes harsher sentences are needed to combat this recent wave of increasing youth violence. We have a tremendous number of kids who are committing person offenses, murders, rapes, robberies, assaults. Something has to be done. What is being done is that many young convicts are growing up behind bars. Being sentenced as an adult means being treated as an adult. This is big time. This is serious business. Curtis Wingard is the warden of Madison Correctional. When they come to this facility, they are going to be behind the fence, and this becomes their new neighborhood. Their cell becomes their new home. And their new school. Not far from Madison is Southeastern Correctional Facility in Lancaster, Ohio, where Stephen Huffman is warden. If the inmate um, does not have his GED or high school uh, equivalency uh, diploma, uh, we require him to go to school. Warden Huffman remembers when it was harder for young inmates to better themselves in prison. I started with the department uh, uh, 16 years ago. There wasn't much programming, education at the time. For kids like Isaiah Robinson, who grow up in broken homes, poor, and on the streets. And then my dad, he wasn't around at the time. Prison is often the only true discipline they've ever known. I learned a lot, though, since I've been here. But there's no place nobody want to be, though. The willingness to put young offenders away for a long time isn't reserved for just murderers like Bobby Sheets. Isaiah Robinson, now 16, was convicted of a robbery when he was 15. He got 7 to 25 years. And then I had a knife, and I, and I put it to the lady. And she gave us the money and everything else. I'm glad this happened right now and later in my life. I still got a chance to make something of it. I know when I get out, I have to get a job, go to school, and then teach my brothers on the right path. I don't want to end up where I'm at right now. Even for veteran wardens, seeing the long years ahead of these young faces is troubling. A young individual coming to adult facility um, it concerns me because I see a youngster basically throwing a large portion of their life away. You know, I mean, what kind of life am I going to have? You know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to suck. But on the other hand, we have individuals that young that have committed uh, crimes are, that are outrageous, murder, um, rape. It will be 52 years before we know the effects prison will have on Bobby Sheets. That's when he goes in front of a parole board. Until then, he and others like him struggle to make the hours pass. At night times when I do a lot of thinking, and I think about, like, if I didn't meet these people in my case, you know, where would I be at today? It's my TV, you know, my radio, locker box, my stand. I've had a drinking problem in prison, which is, you just mix a bunch of stuff together, like orange juice, a fruit cocktail, some bread, and some, a lot of sugar. You just let it sit for like a week, and it turns into alcohol. The prisoners make tattoo guns with the motor from a cassette player, ink, it's, and guitar it's, strings it's as needles. Belt. My dad had it on his arm at the same spot, so it's just that kind of thing. An average day in prison is uh, play cards, read. It's basically, it's the same thing. There really ain't too much to do in here. I think about my mom a lot, wondering how she's doing. She's also in prison. So uh, I wonder if she's having any problems, you know, if she's, you know, how she's doing. Because many young offenders will someday get out, noted Harvard Law Professor Arthur Miller worries about the lasting effects adult prisons will have on young inmates and whether they can be rehabilitated in such a harsh environment. You put that kid in there, he will be maimed, sodomized, and possibly killed. Do you want that to happen to any kid? Despite the rise in youth violence, many say adult prisons are the worst possible solution. It's remarkable to me, given the rate at which young people are locked up as adults, that there has been virtually no research, almost no research, 
that has asked the question of what happens to kids who are locked up in adult institutions. Jeffrey Fagan is the director of the Center for Violence Research and Prevention at Columbia University. Kids are being exposed to physical danger, to sexual assault, um, increased exposure to um, intravenous drug use, uh, HIV infection from a variety of different vectors. Um, they are likely to come out brutalized and uh, prisonized um, in ways that just simply don't happen when kids experience the juvenile system. Some have even paid the ultimate price. At 16, D'Amico Watkins was convicted of being a lookout during a pizza store robbery in Cincinnati. He got 5 to 25 years and was shipped off to this maximum security prison in London, Ohio. Kim Watkins is D'Amico's mother. But I mean, I love you. I, I mean, <laughs> it just hurt to, you know, not to hear his voice no more, not to see. Because of a new Ohio law, juveniles are now sent to adult prisons, but are required to have separate sleeping quarters. Stand up! Hey! Stand up! But on April 25th, 1996, members of the white supremacist gang, the Aryan Nation, all adult inmates, broke into his cell in this pod. From what we know at this point, when the Aryan Nation got there, they had homemade knives, or maybe they had some knives from the kitchen. We don't know at this point. And they bludgeoned that boy. They stabbed him in his head. They stabbed him all over his body. And that, Thomas Harris that, is a lawyer representing D'Amico's family, which is suing the state. I wish he was here. And I wish I was with him. Convicted murderer Bobby Sheets is also housed in that part of Madison Prison. He witnessed the murder. It was like five uh, Aaron brothers. They basically killed this, killed this black dude over some little petty stuff. You know, I've seen him getting stuck. That's really scary. Uh, the prison basically was established around 1987. And far as homicides are concerned, we've only had uh, one homicide here. Warden Curtis Wingard won't talk about the specifics of the murder because of the lawsuit. Yes, we have made some necessary changes. We have limited the movement. We've also added some extra uh, security officers. That doesn't help D'Amico, though. D'Amico is dead at this point. The killing was what critics warned about. Kids in prison only get harder or more brutalized. You can get more drugs in jail than you can on the street. You can commit more offenses in jail than you can on the street. And nobody seems to care about it. They just let you go on like a bunch of wild animals. We're not going to jeopardize anyone's life purposely. We're going to do everything we possibly can to make sure not only that they're safe, but they have a secure and humane environment to do their time in. These are our children. They can be saved. Jail is not the place to do it. What happened to D'Amico Watkins is the fear of young inmates like 16-year-old Dushan Williams, who is serving two to four years for assault. Especially when, from my area in the Bronx, you know, it's a lot of things that go on. And I got to defend myself, you know what I'm saying? Now I'm in jail and I, I still got to defend myself. Michelle Williams is Dushan's mom. Oh, yeah, I worry about it. Because, I mean, he... He's a, he, he's a juvenile, and he's in there with hardened criminals, you know, people that are murderers and rapists, and I don't feel that young kids should be in there with adults. Really, my dream, I want to be a super, a super of a building. I want to, you know, that's why I'm taking building maintenance in here, custodial maintenance. Where's your Chippendale drawing? I'm going to pitch you that Deshaun sent you. He loves to draw, yes. and he loves to rap. This is what Deshaun did. Mm-hmm. He gave this to, to, to his, his nephew and to his brother. And, and where, did he, where did he do that? Upstate. It says from Daddy on the bottom? From Big Daddy, Uncle uh, D. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what he called himself. He called himself Sweet Pea or Big Shicey. Daddy. Shicey. <laughs> Shicey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he, he did that while See, he, he got up here to my junior nutcases, Raheem and Earl. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah he has he had he has some uh, he has. Uh, quite a few draws, but they're not here. Yeah, well, he's a smart kid. He's very smart, and I believe what he you know that he learned a lesson. Dushan says he's trying to stay away from prison's dangers and focus on going home. Look, like this. Take it just like that, right? And get to the edge and you flip it on top of this one. Then you move it over like that, okay? Uh, All right, now you do it. Let me move this one around. All right, now when you flip it, flip it and just have it on the edge and, and flip it on top of this one. Okay. Wait a minute. That's okay. All right. And just take There you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then you take it. Press down on okay. it. Okay, go ahead. Next down on it. Go ahead. Keep that going. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. And another one. It's a lot of games, you know? Try not to be involved with all that, you know? I ain't trying to get too much into this jail thing, you know? I'm just trying to benefit for myself to go home, you know? But home has its own dangers. These kids today, even if you step on a toe or you bump into them, they're ready to shoot you. And it's scary. These kids are very scary. He's a very smart person, and uh, uh, since he's been incarcerated, he changes values. And, and um, um, he's into a, a religious, he's, he's into the Bible now, you know, he's being, being religious. Um, he saw it where, like, like my grandma used to say, you got the right shoes on walking in the wrong direction. And now he found out that, you know, it, 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 if he keep on, just keep on continuing, then he's going to be, he's, that's, that's going to be his home. A few blocks from where Deshaun grew up, there's a gathering of DM, the Decatur Mob, headquartered on 197th Street and Decatur Avenue in the Bronx. Decatur, baby. That's right, 96, 97. Come on, love. Their members are young and tough. Use blades, knives, whatever you can use. They carry razors in their mouths for like fights. <laughs> we use that, you know what I'm saying, to pull out our mouth. If anything, we just slice you, you know what I'm saying? I'll carve, I'll carve my initials or whatever. That's what I do. Sonny. Believe it, kid, I'm not bugging ever since they knew I was coming. They all fell. Birds in the sky getting prepared to form an L. Sick <laughs> the gang problem helped fuel the teen crime wave filling our prisons. In 1992, more than 70 of our largest cities reported gang crime problems, according to a report cited by the Office of Juvenile Justice. For inner city kids, role models often come from the street. Uh, his name is Palolo. He just got shot on some street. He knew everybody from everywhere, so he was like the cool, like, you know what I'm saying, like a godfather, you know what I'm saying? He knew everybody. A gang is protection. Where many kids from broken homes find families. Bismo 17 is DM's leader. Did we call ourselves the mob because we together. We act, we fans. I see all family. I've been locked up. Half of us been arrested. That's not the point. The point is that we keep it real to the end. The initiation, fight the gang members and prove your worth. So now you don't want it? Hit that door before I hit your face. I don't even talk about me here. You don't even say what's up to me either because you just dissed me right now. Right now, they just want to be down for protection. Who want protection? I already seen that in his eyes. He already said he wanted to be down for protection. He didn't say it in his mouth, but he said it in his body. Like, Soldier. Put it right there. And just move it. Everybody learned this in jail. That's what jail, that's where this comes from. Even though the latest statistics show a drop in crime nationwide, law enforcement officials are predicting a grim future. The teenage population is expected to balloon to more than 73 million by the year 2010. 
Law enforcement leaders, including yep. FBI Director Louis Free, warned that nine million more teens could mean more violence, drugs, and death. With teen thugs getting more violent than ever, according to John DiUlio, we're headed for the worst teen crime wave ever. Between 1990 and the year 2010, we're likely to have a doubling, a doubling in the number of juveniles who are arrested in this country. Newark, New Jersey, the town where the term carjacking was coined. Look over there. Look over there. See that? Look at that. Look at that. Look at look that. Look at 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 that. that. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. A tough town trying to bounce back from its troubles. To lay the hands with a high juvenile crime rate. To crack down on juvenile crime and keep kids from going to prison, Newark, like other big cities, started a curfew. Dispatch on three. We had a two to put the... That curfew is in effect. The curfew ordinance be enforced. Kids under 18 are not allowed on the street between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. without a good reason. You may not like it if we have to arrest you or take you into custody or stop you, but this is part of the part of the job. Lieutenant Joseph Falaro has been a Newark beat cop for 23 years. A large volume of arrests are juveniles. They tend to be the most violent, the most aggressive of any crime group. The courts, they're just too lenient. It, it, and you know what it is? It, they're flooded. They're flooded with the rest and complaints against juveniles that they can't, they can't handle. But many critics say the adult system isn't any better. Jeffrey Fagan studied the recidivism or re-arrest rate for two groups of kids. One group in the adult system, another in the juvenile system. And what we found quite simply was that there, the kids who were incarcerated as adults, who were sentenced and incarcerated as adults, had higher rates of recidivism compared to identical kids who were incarcerated and sentenced as juveniles. Fagan concluded that treating young convicts as adults did not deter crime, it accelerated it. Mike Ledica, 15, an Ohio Southeastern Correctional, is the center of the debate about putting young kids away for a long time. He's one of the youngest in that state's prison system. When, uh, friend was out. Uh, he went inside and wanted to rob somebody. It was uh, February 6th, it was two days after my 15th birthday. And instead of robbing him, he shot the guy in the back of the head. Mike didn't pull the trigger, but it was his gun, and he was there. Now he's serving 7 to 25 years for manslaughter. It wasn't worth it. You gotta, you gotta really, you gotta be here to know for yourself if it was worth it or not. But because often they are physically diminutive, they are subject to attack and quite vulnerable. Um, they will become somebody's girlfriend very, very fast. And that's very scary and very sad. But for convicts who grew up in prison and saw their youth wasted behind bars, their experience can hopefully teach others before it's too late. Y'all got any questions? Okay, keep it single file and let's, let's go inside. Growing up behind bars, what did they learn? To be scared of prison or to be better criminals? The way you carry yourself at the end of the day is going to determine how we are going to treat you. In other words, if you want to act like children, you want to laugh, you want to giggle, you want to be, you know, a little silly or whatever, we're going to treat you like kids. At Otisville Prison in upstate New York, inmates with the Youth Assistance Program Dude, want them scared. Kids. Because once upon a time, we were you. Sonny, the group leader, has served more than 11 years for arson and murder. Well, it was a drug war, drug beef, you know, territory thing. Today he's talking to troubled teens from an alternative high school in Orange County, New York. All right, when we introduce ourselves, we introduce ourselves by number. Because when you come to prison, you lose your rights for your name. My name is 19 5279. I'm 8 to 30 to 25 years for manslaughter. Been in jail since I was 16, I'm 25. 91 8, 27, 84, 75, 15 for Minnesota. I've been in jail since I was 16, I'm 44 years old, I got seven years in jail. 91 8, 6, 0, 21. I've been there for murder, 31 years old, I got 15 years in. 
Chicho Juna. We're going to charge him with uh, attempted robbery. Now here's another bad teenage spot right here. Back on the street, for the kids who don't take the warning seriously, the world has become a very dangerous place. That quarter store, that Chinese restaurant, the Orange Kitchen, used to be a confectionery store newspaper. For Polaro, the teen crime problem hits home. And that's where my uncle was uh, shot and killed in a holdup. Two teenagers went in, held him up, and shot and killed him. So it touched, it, you know, it touched me personally. He's out right, to stop these location? young kids from a life on the streets. I think it was an armed robbery. Before the street takes that life. This young man died after holding up a used car lot and shooting the owner. He held up the place. In other words, he shot the guy. Right. And they subdued him. Right. And the guy had a ski mask on, too. Okay. Employees so he there died, grabbed he, him. He died right he there. suffocated right. The while they were holding okay. him for police. Yeah, well, he's a veteran. If he'd done it now, he'd done it before. Yeah, absolutely. Police say the robber had an extensive juvenile record. There's a lot of kids right now that we're going to lose. And it's a damn shame because these kids, uh, they deserve better. They deserve a better shot at life. I'm 86A2462. I'm serving 8 and a third to 25 for an arson and a murder. I currently have 11 and a half years in. And we sacrifice ourselves, hopefully, that they won't go through these experiences that we went through. Some of you said you've been to a wake before, right? See, that's one thing you get in prison. If you lose a loved one, someone close in the family, a mother, brother, sister, something like that, child, see, they give you the respect to go to the funeral. This is how I had to go say goodbye to my sister. This is what you look like. How would you feel, God forbid, standing in front of your family like that? How would you feel? Well, we don't get the respect of animals. There was a whole lot that came before me, and there's a whole lot that's coming after me. And we don't want you to be one of them. That's why we're here. We don't get These inmates want the kids to know life behind bars is serious. These knives were all confiscated from inmates at Otisville. Deacon Eugene Borman runs the program. But I've seen kids coming up the walkway to the building, you know, having themselves a good time, you know, really not thinking that they're in jail. You know what we're down here telling you? If you don't think that you're going to pay for the little mistakes that you make, see the little things that you do that turn into big things you think can't happen to you, you're going to end up paying for it. I've seen them walk away from the program with a completely changed attitude. Even DiUlio, while favoring harsher sentences for violent kids, walks at putting them in with adults. It is an absolute mistake to incarcerate juvenile offenders alongside adults. The only thing that happens in jail is that you become a better criminal. That is it. People forget those who go to prison come out of prison. If they come out of prison worse, because they're still not skilled, they're still not educated, they picked up all sorts of bad habits, kids going to adult prisons will learn how to become adult criminals. One rural New York town learned the hard way just what it takes to be considered an adult in the eyes of the law. Well, it was August 2nd, 1993. That morning it kind of looked like rain, but I you know, I wasn't going to let him go, but then he insisted that he wanted to play kickball that day. So I let him go, and he uh, hopped down off the steps, and he just said, I love you, Mom. And that's, that's the last time I saw him. He's going to eat your face. <laughs> this is where we lived, right here. And Derek came out of the steps right there, came down the sidewalk, and proceeded down this sidewalk here. He was intercepted halfway down the street by Eric Smith. It was a case that made headlines across the country. A freckled-faced 13-year-old murdered a four-year-old boy in a quiet, upstate New York town for no apparent reason. As soon as Derek got in front of him, he hooked him with his arm up under his neck. Then he took his body to a pile of rocks and hit him in the head twice with a 40-pound rock. He then hit him with a sharp rock in the head about 12 times. He sodomized him with a stick. What we're dealing with is 
number one, a child, and number two, a sick child. The child was uh, now 14 Eric years Smith old. Eric Smith was tried as an adult. Because of his age, he was sentenced to nine years to life in prison. For the crime of murder in the second degree and as a juvenile offender, Eric Smith is If he had been 16, his sentence would have been 25 years to life. That's because New York has a middle tier for kid criminals treated as adults. Kids under 16 are treated as juvenile offenders. They are tried in court and sentenced to adult prisons, but are held in youth detention facilities until they turn 18. Then they're sent to an adult prison. He cannot be rehabilitated. I think once, I think once they kill and they know what it feels like to kill, there's absolutely no rehabilitation. If he had been tried in family court, his records would have been sealed from the public, which is meant to give young offenders a second chance. But more and more, no one wants to give today's teens that chance. The risk seems too high. It is an adult crime. I mean, the fear of this being, I think, withheld from the public, too, was like, no way, this kid, you know, people ought to know what he did. Eric Smith's stepfather, Ted, raised Eric from birth. No matter what my son has ever done in life, I'll never, I'll never quit loving him. When he realized what his adopted son had done, he made one of the toughest decisions a parent could make. Yeah, we, we did call the police. We had to tell the authorities so they weren't still looking for somebody. But at 13, Ted Smith wonders what could have turned his son into a killer. As a stepfather, he takes some of the blame. I think I hold more against myself than what he could ever hold against me. Basically, and the words I used back then would wimpy. He was a crybaby. When he found later that Eric was to be tried as an adult and faced time in an adult prison, the elder Smith felt betrayed. No, I don't feel my son is still an adult. He knew what he was doing, so he should be responsible. Psychologically, he needs help. And where he is at now, I'm sure the people mean well, but I don't think they're capable. Smith says his son has adjusted to his new life. He gets mental health counseling, goes to school, and is even allowed to play basketball. Never be like it was before, that's for sure. I'm sorry. They can go and talk to him. They can touch him. I have to drive to a cold cemetery and stand by a big black stone. You don't go from 1.7 million juvenile arrests to 2.7 million in three years simply because there's something in the water or something in the air. Many prosecutors agree harsher laws help. Ohio passed one recently. House Bill 1, one of the significant things that it did was lower the age which a, uh, a juvenile can be tried as an adult from the age of 15 to the age of 14. While that may not sound like much, there are a number of 14-year-olds out there, unfortunately, who are as bad as any adult that we've seen. In the 1990s, a number of people, myself included, have used the term super predator or juvenile super predator, or as some others have said, the young and the ruthless, to refer to the kids at the other end of the continuum, the kids who are impulsively violent. It's, it's just too easy to say, oh, this new breed, like they're genetically bred to be super predators and we have to treat them differently. Whether he was a super predator or a scared kid with a gun, Shabad Jones was a kid out of control. By 15, he had been arrested six times and had already been expelled from a youth home for continuously running away. In the spring of 1986, he pleaded guilty to armed robbery. But while waiting to be sentenced, he met Stephen McDonald. McDonald was starting his career as a promising young police officer, one of a long line of proud New York City police officers. His father, grandfather, and uncles all wore blue before him. He was married eight months when tragedy, in the form of Shabad Jones, struck. His wife, Patty, was pregnant when she rushed to the hospital. And I just kind of freaked out a bit because his body was so swollen from the trauma. He almost looked like a Frankenstein. And the priest had given him his last rites. But despite the brutal crime, he survived. The gunshot paralyzed Stephen from the neck down. I thought I saw a gun stuck in the sock of, of 
the smaller of the three boys. I bent down to touch it, and as I did that, I looked up, and Shabacho was moving quickly towards me, shot me in the head, and, and I saw that. The pain, the smoke, the, the flame from the barrel of the gun I was falling back, and Shavad Jones, as I laid on the ground, stood over me and fired into me a few more times. Shavad Jones spent eight years in prison for the shooting. Several months after I was shot, after the birth of my son, I forgave Shavad Jones. And Shavad called me not too long after his prison uh, sentence incarceration and apologized for having done this terrible thing and we promised each other that someday we would get together and do, do some work together. Three days after Shavad got out of prison in 1995, he fell off a speeding motorcycle and died. Today, Patty McDonald needs the help of a full-time nurse to take care of Stephen. He can't dress himself. He must breathe through a respirator. Okay. He can't wash himself. It's not a normal life, but it is normal it can be under the circumstances. But he is still a cop, and he takes his job very seriously. Last year, the department made Stephen a detective. He wears badge number 104, his grandfather's badge. Today, Stephen is preparing to go to a Long Island school to talk to children about staying out of trouble. It is his new duty as a New York City police detective. How does it feel to be paralyzed? I haven't been able to play uh, ball with my son uh, ever since he's been born. I missed out on a lot with him, and my wife, Patty Ann, and I haven't held hands or gone for a walk in 10 years. He wants the kids to understand there is pain all around in his story. Very hard, and, and the young man who shot me went away to prison for eight years of his life. And that's a long time. Even forgiven, Jones, he feels that the judge who had shot me in court two months before we met that fateful day in Central Park. Uh, he was a troubled juvenile, a threat to himself and society, and I believe he had no right being outside. To hold judges responsible for what is going on in the society right now in terms of uh, criminal justice, I, I think is, is uh, a bit, uh, it's gone a bit too far, in my opinion. It's gone more than a bit too far. Bronx juvenile judge John Moore was not involved in the Shabbat Jones case, but criticism of the judiciary when it comes to juvenile crime is nothing new to his ears. Cases that uh, do go wrong and where tragic things happen, you're a human being. You can't, you can't help but feel terrible about the situation. After prison, if young convicts have trouble going straight, will they turn back to the thug's life? 
From the ivory tower to the streets, the search is on to salvage our youngest criminals while protecting us from them. When you stay in juvenile court, there's a chance that you can be rehabilitated. You are amenable to treatment at that point. Once you go to prison, the adult prison, the only thing that happens is that you become thicker and slicker. There are certain kids, however, who I believe we can't help in the juvenile system. Uh, the only thing we can do is try to protect society from these individuals for a, as long a period as, as we can keep them incarcerated. What about those you can help? In Crown Heights, Brooklyn, that's Richard Green's lifelong challenge. At 18, Green got shipped off to Vietnam. When he returned, he had seen enough young men die who didn't have options. Okay. Now he tries to spread peace by reaching out to kids on the street. I was telling him you wanted the success stories. You went through you went through carpentry carpentry school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Growing up these days in this community is a tough tough scenario. I lost a young man right in that store over there. Him and the store owner got into a little squabble. The store owner was actually holding holding a gun on him till till the cops came, and the gun accidentally went off. They know the van, you know. Everybody in this Crown Heights know this van. If they change this van on me. I'd be in trouble. Keep it clean, do your shit, your earth and it's your air. Green and friends paint the otherwise bleak walls around them with inspirational murals. We're making a little change here and there, putting it a little bit here, a little bit there. And I know what this block was like three, four years ago. You know, so I think we're winning. Back at Green's Crown Heights Youth Collective, he pushes to keep kid convicts out of prison by offering alternatives. I've been in court with judges, and I've said to the judge, hey, uh, let this young man out. If he has any kind of concerns, you can call me. Why do you have your coat on? Why don't you take your coat off and stay a while? There's no young person that commits any act that I feel that's beyond redemption. Okay, Roberto, 17, just got out of prison and Green is helping him get his life back together. I came here, you know, to ask for advice and to stay away from the trouble that's happening out there in the world. And basically, Mr. Green just looks out and I see him as a role model. You know, I look up to this man because he probably made me who I am right now. There is, again, redemption here. There, he, this young man has a great future in front of him and that's what this is all about. We keep him in total check in here. There's no activities tonight. <laughs> you wouldn't know that, right? <laughs> Wednesday's a quiet night. Green says the center provides a safe environment in an unsafe world where kids have a chance to learn. Ah, very good, see? There you go. So we need mentoring programs, uh, adults involved in the lives of children who need them, non-parental adult influence. But even programs like Green's reach only a fraction of the kids in trouble. The rest are either locked up or released on probation to be monitored, like Stephen McDonald's attacker, Shavad Jones. I am in favor of lengthier sentences and the juveniles being kept in to um, complete those sentences. I suppose there's a certain safety that you get by taking kids, waiting until they're so decrepit that they're nobody's threat, and putting them back on the street. The question is, economically, did that make sense? Socially, did that make sense? Is that what a civilized country should be doing? On balance, we're producing more criminality than we are producing it. Um, I think society will pay very dearly in the future for this uh, misguided effort. The point I would make is, how many people have we saved during that seven-year period of time when they've been incarcerated as an adult? The Romans used to say, what a society does to its children, its children will eventually do to society. You know, you know, the only thing I can do is try to better myself. And that's, that's the only thing that you can do in here. This is uh, the areas where everybody, all the kids now, um, is just like if I say something to someone, so one of them, they want to curse me out. You know, and it could be on, on for their favor. 
you know, are you not my father? Are you, are you, you, you know, what you want to do and wait till I get back. And next thing you know, I might be laid on the sidewalk or something, or they come back with three or four other guys. You know, it's, like she said, it's, it's a scary thing now. I'm liable to catch a body or catch a bullet. No matter what happens, I represent until the bullets dark side. Crazy ass niggas who be killing and stealing. Niggas standing on the corners who be dealing. Bodies ending up in the casket. It's tragic.